So, Mr. President, take your campaign of division and anger and hate back to Chicago. A strategy shift from Mitt Romney as the campaign dynamic changes. We reached a point where we were both just like, I'm not going to be a victim anymore. I'm tired of this. Also today, glimmers of hope in Florida. The Connecticut Senate race. Executive editor Jill Abramson talks politics. And op-ed columnist Joe Nocera on just how much the conversation has changed. I mean, if you're Obama, you're kind of hoping that the economy fades into the background as a campaign. I'm Carolyn Ryan, live from the New York Times newsroom. We've seen a striking shift this week in the Romney campaign strategy. The candidate himself is going straight at President Obama. Take a look at this remarkable clip from Tuesday. His campaign and his surrogates have made wild and reckless accusations that disgrace the office of the presidency. This is what an angry and desperate presidency looks like. President Obama knows better, promised better, and America deserves better. Michael Barbaro covers the Romney campaign for us, and he joins me here now. Michael, why is this so nasty so quickly? Well, I think a number of things are going on. You know, one thing is that there have actually been a lot of attacks on the Obama campaign and from their allies that have wounded the Romney people. I mean, like, on a personal level, they really don't like it. So this is Romney. not theatrics? This is oh, real? it is, and we'll get there. Okay. But I mean, I think on, on just on a very cert, on a very kind of first base level, uh, Romney thinks his integrity is his greatest virtue. But then there's a much larger context, which is that the president's likability, the fact that he stays kind of personally popular with people despite everything going on a horrible economy is a big problem for the Romney campaign. They want to bring him back down to earth and probably drag him back down. And one way you do that is by relentlessly describing him as somebody who has diminished the office of the White House, who's run, a, you know, sort of a, an unprecedentedly negative campaign. What the Romney campaign is now essentially arguing is that the president you bought is not the president you have anymore, and you can see that in his negative campaigning. Well, one thing that was interesting today, uh, and we were hoping you could illuminate this a little bit, one issue that the Romney people haven't wanted to talk about is the candidate's personal wealth and his taxes. And yet today he came out and described in some detail what he has paid in income taxes. Can you tell us about that? And were you surprised? I, I, I was actually, I'm, I'm still quite mystified uh, that Governor Romney would bring this up right now. But let's get to the numbers. Um, the governor said that he's never paid below 13% personal income tax rate. Um, that's actually quite a bit of news because one of the great questions was um, did, were there years where he maybe paid no taxes given the very unique way he earned money which lowered the rate and the fact and that Harry Reid had come out and said yep, Senator he Reed had paid come no out taxes. Without any evidence and said he paid no taxes. The big question here is is Governor Romney play by our rules like everybody else in terms of his finances and the Democrats have seized on that and I cannot tell you why he brought this up because it simply gives the Democrats another chance to say to bring up the issue and to say we don't trust you, show us the evidence. It's one thing to produce a report from your tax advisor saying this is what you've paid, 30% every year, but just to say it on a tarmac in South Carolina does nothing to end the debate. There's no evidence actually behind that. I mean, we'd like to think he's telling the truth, but uh, trust, but verify. So you think this will just trigger more discussion and scrutiny of his a Absolutely. I, I, I would like to spend a couple of hours talking to people to figure out why he chose this day right after he announced DVP when the conversation was changing to bring this up. I, I'm surprised. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, you're seen as a reporter who uh, is very observant about personality and character. One of the d dynamics here is that Romney is still not as likable, as you say, according to polls, as Obama. You see him up close, you see him with his family, with uh, people on the trail. Is he a likable man? You know, as I think uh, Barack Obama told Hillary Clinton, <laughs> he's likable <laughs> enough. Um, there's an essential stiffness. There's, a, there's an unknowability, uh, kind of a, a, a shield around Governor Romney that I'd say even those of us who spend the most time with him find difficult to breach. Um, and I think that, that essential kind of unknowability combined with the reputation he has from all the advertising and all the newspaper stories and television pieces done about his business life combine to create an image of somebody that a lot of people in America don't like or find hard to warm up to. Right, right. Now, does the addition to Paul Ryan just in sort of a spiritual, psychological sense in any way help Romney's likability? I think what it, what it offers is 
you know, this sort of young guy who looks like an altar boy who is very fresh-faced, energetic, a man of ideas. But we don't see a transforming people's thinking about Governor Romney. And that's just historical because vice presidential running mates tend not to fundamentally alter the way people view tickets. Right, right. Nobody covers it as well as you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being on the show. My pleasure. One reason for this shift is that the Romney campaign seems to have discovered that running a campaign purely on the economy might not work, especially as glimmers of hope emerge. And it's not clear how an economic message will play this fall. In a place where dreams are in short supply these days, Marcus and Kate Freeman are hopeful. Uh, this is the corner of Duff in 98, and uh, this is where I want my restaurant. This is going to be the place. Marcus has plans to open a chili restaurant in a strip mall near their home. Oh, I got it. Do you hear that pop? Yeah. My intent is, is by September, I would really, really like to be in enough position that I can physically open the doors. Take that and I'll give you a couple spoons. Just last January, the family was on the brink of losing everything. We um, actually are in the process of um, kind of losing our house. <laughs> Their home was in foreclosure, and they were so desperate to make ends meet that they were selling homemade chili by the side of the road. It was scary. We didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't have any savings built up to find out, you know, where we were going to go. And we just felt like we were homeless with a roof over our head. Yeah. What's the matter? Their problems were so severe that they almost split. We actually considered separating. It felt like we were drowning. And he wanted to just get, he wanted to just say, look, I'll just, I'll walk away. I'll walk away. The roadside operation was shut down by a health inspector. But then the situation improved. Kate got her teaching certification and her salary doubled. Marcus is now taking classes to learn how to run his own business. This is my chili. This is the, this is our sizzling. This is the hottest one. And although they project a fresh optimism today, they're skeptical that any help can come from a politician. I don't think it matters. I don't think it matters who you vote for. Honestly, I, I really wouldn't vote for either of them. When we met Kate in January, she was undecided, but leaning towards the Republican Party. I tend to, I tend to stay on, on the conservative side, um, but I try to listen to what everybody has to say. But now, neither party appeals to her. They're such a, a strong, a, a strong disconnect. You know, they're multimillionaires. They just don't live in the same world that we live in. The Freemans say they will make a last minute decision on who to vote for in November. By then, Marcus expects his restaurant to be open. I don't think people are experienced enough on what they can do with chili. I mean, it can be on anything. I mean, hamburgers, hot dogs, fries. Oh, we do it with baked potatoes. It's great. A little closer to home, Linda McMahon this week got her second chance to run for a Senate seat in Connecticut. Michael Grimbaum is covering the race and he joins me here now. Michael, has Linda McMahon connected with Connecticut voters in a different way this time? Yeah, this is a very different Linda McMahon that we've seen from two years ago when she lost by about 12 points in her attempt to win the Senate seat. Uh, you know, the biggest shift is that she lost big among women voters in Connecticut last time. They really did not uh, uh, attach to her. So she's completely changed the way that she's presented herself to women voters, and she's very much focusing on them in this, in this new race this year. So the question that has come up from her supporters and from her detractors, last time she was haunted by the world wrestling past and the kind of uh, sex and violence that is part of that industry. Do you expect that to be an issue this time or has she kind of transcended it? So, so it's interesting, you know, last time she ran as kind of the hard charging executive and she really tried to appeal to, you know, for lack of a better phrase, the Real Housewives of Greenwich, you know, sort of these, uh, you know, women who are from the Fairfield County community she's from. She tried to present herself as having built a global corporation. But women voters in Connecticut were repulsed by the wrestling world, the sex and the violence. This time around, she's talking about growing up poor, how she and her husband got through bankruptcy, how she can help small businesses create jobs. It's a lot more Sandra Lee than Hulk Hogan. Now tell us about her opponent, Chris Murphy. He's obviously not as well known as Richard Blumenthal was when he ran. Uh, will he be aggressive? What is his background? What do we expect in terms of their engagement? You know, a lot of Democrats in Washington see Chris Murphy as one of the rising stars of the Democratic Party. He's 39 years old. He has a young family, very fresh-faced. Uh, so he has a lot of potential, but the reality is that about 45% of Connecticut voters don't even know who he is. You know, last time around, Linda was facing 
as you said, Richard Blumenthal's a patrician. I mean, he's as close as Connecticut comes to a Kennedy. Uh, Chris Murphy's going to really have to get out there, go off to the far corners of the state, uh, a lot of manufacturing towns, more rural communities, where people just aren't aware of him. And does he have the money? We're assuming that she will. She's going to outspend him. You know, last time around, I think it was 16 to 1. I, I, you know, there's no question. Uh, you know, Richard Blumenthal ended up squeaking through last time. You know, I think Chris Murphy's going to get a lot of support from the Washington Democrat, from the Democratic Party. They're already parachuting in operatives to bring up wrestling. Uh, you know, McMahon is trying to keep that completely out of the race. But uh, rest assured, Chris is going to come out aggressive on that issue. Now, tell us this. You grew up in Connecticut, a proud product, I believe, of uh, Hall High School in West Hartford. They still talk about you there. Go Warriors. Um, the, uh, what has happened to the sort of prototypical uh, New England moderate Republican? Has that species gone the way of the woolly mammoth? I mean, is there is that basically from another era? Yeah, I think the Catherine Hepburn era in Connecticut has, has come to a close. I, you know, I mean, the nutmeg state's not impervious to national trends. Uh, people, Chris Shays, who's, you know, as close as they come to a Yan Yankee centrist politician, People, you heard again and again from voters at the polls this week at the primary, career politician, been there too long, too close to Washington. Like Republicans around the country, they want an outsider. They want someone who's going to shake things up. And business credentials seem to be the major issue that, that voters are looking for. A lot of people said, I like that Linda wants to create jobs, that she's you know, going to help out small businesses. Well, it'll be a great race to watch, and thank you very much. Michael Grinbaum. Thanks for having me. The campaign is obviously a topic of great interest and intensity here in the New York Times newsroom, and a lot of this is driven by our executive editor, Jill Abramson. Jill recently sat down with assistant managing editor Rick Burke to talk politics and the roots of her interest in elections. You know, I fell in love with covering politics as a journalist when I was still in college. I was a stringer for Time magazine, and I got to go up and cover the New Hampshire primary. I never forget the Sheraton Wayfair Hotel up in Manchester, seeing the literal boys on the bus. That was, you know, the famous book that was written uh, about the, the press corps and all of the people who were in that book, including Hunter Thompson, were at the bar at the Sheraton Wayfair after the the, the ballots came. And they were and boys. Then, they were oh, all boys. Oh, it was definitely <laughs> all men. And I was, you know, the youngest person around, and I didn't dare, you know, belly up to the bar. I was just watching from afar, were you sipping longingly. A were you I probably, sipping a Coke I'm or sure, something? I'm sure, because I was in college, yeah. even though the drinking age had <laughs> gone down to 18, that I wouldn't have dared had anything but a Coke. Now, I still see you these days calling sources, political sources, emailing. You just can't help yourself, can you? <laughs> I can't help myself, and it just is still the thing I love to, if I have time to just gab, I'd love to be gabbing about what's going on in the campaign. Now talking about great stories, let's talk about Ryan for a second. What are you most curious about about the Ryan candidacy? I'm fascinated by like the dealings that Romney and Ryan have had over time. Romney is someone whose views have changed over time, certainly most markedly from when he was governor of Massachusetts. And I'm interested in any points at which Romney really submerged himself in the substance of Ryan's approach to issues like the budget and Social Security and Medicare and how he came to the point uh, in the primaries this year of embracing the Ryan plan. What's your philosophy about conventions and you know it seems like every four years we're all saying let's shrink our coverage they don't mean anything well we are in some ways sending less people because the amount of news that's actually generated at the conventions is probably less than it was in the old days but it's still a forum where people come and discuss a platform it's where the messaging for the general election gets set my philosophy philosophy of news is that the most interesting stories are often the story behind a news event, both in terms of fundraising and plant plotting political strategy. And we are aimed at capturing that drama. Now, I have to ask you this final question. Are you going to be sad when this is all over? 
you know, I've been involved in covering these campaigns going back to 1976, which seems scarcely believable to me, but uh, I always get a little bit sad when they're over, and I always think I'm never going to cover an election as interesting as this one has been, and then they always are. Now on to opinion. Charles Blow sat down earlier with fellow columnist Joe Nacera to discuss how the Ryan pick has changed the focus of this campaign. So the Paul Ryan pick, what does this mean? What does this do to the race? Well, um, now that the dust is starting to settle a little bit, you have to sort of wonder what was going through Mitt Romney's mind, honestly. He had one issue that was going to work for him, if anything was going to work, and that was the economy, which is really in bad shape and, from my point of view, isn't going to get a lot better between now and November. And suddenly, the debate is about to shift because Ryan is in the race from the economy to the Ryan budget, the shrink the government, the, the, and especially the Medicare uh, plan that he's proposed, you know, which, was a, which is a voucher fan that, plan that will almost surely cost people more money, seniors more money out of their pockets. So, so point one, why would, you, why would you make that change? Why exactly. would you veer away from the economy? That, and, and do you think that that's Obama's, you know, is, is the Obama campaign having the impact that they want to have, which is to you change the message, keep hammering him on other things and change the message from the economy. Because if, if you look at it, he hasn't really had an econ message since the you didn't build that. That's, that's uh, right. Package, like three weeks ago. Or I, I, that's right. I mean, if you're Obama, you're kind of hoping that the economy fades into the background as a campaign issue. Right. And now it's going to. Right. Right. Having said that, I like the fact that you have the most articulate Republican spokesman to talk about you know, changing Medicare and shrinking government that you have in the United States. I like that. I think it's useful for the country to, you know, have this broad national presidential debate over the shape and size of government and over what we should do about Medicare. But, and you think that, that, that having that debate as part of a campaign debate is smart and useful? Or, or, or does it get lost in all the billions of dollars of money? Or, you know, is this the right time and place to have that debate? And, it, and does it solve anything? Well, I do think it's the right time and place to have that debate, uh, rather than these congressional skirmishes that elect Tea Party uh, congressmen who come in and, and basically want to throttle the government. Just put it on the table. Let's talk about it. Um, and, and let's see where that goes and, and, and have it in a national sense so that the whole country... Now, will it change things? You know, I don't know. But something has to break the logjam. Right. And you think a debate about math and minutiae? Yeah. I, I don't think it would wind up being a debate about math and minutia. I think it would be a, a, a broad debate about big subjects like, you know, how do you fix Medicare and what is the role of government. Um, I think that's a useful thing to have. Right, right. But, but uh, let, let me just break these two things apart. So role of government, Medicare. Mm -hmm. Right. Role of government maybe is in, a, in the broadest sweep mm -hmm. of things. You can probably make that an argument that people will penetrate enough that people can understand. Mm -hmm. Do I want more government mm -hmm. in my life or less? The Medicare debate, however, seems to me a harder sell because if you're not actually, actually close to being uh, eligible for Medicare or receiving it now, your knowledge of what is Medicare, where does Medicare Part B, mm -hmm. wh which plan takes how many millions of dollars out of it and cuts it or, or, or takes it or shrinks it or changes it to a voucher or not, these are not necessarily things that people are spending a lot of time focused on, unlike, as you said before, the idea of you know, unemployment and the economy where you right. know, does my neighbor have a job, yes or no? Did, did the house down the street go in foreclosure and bring down the value of my home, yes or no? Those are things that seem to me to resonate more, but the Medicare debate you know, doesn't have that. Right, the problem is that, that people don't really want to talk about Medicare, but at some point the country has to because it is, a, it is an entitlement program that keeps growing and growing and growing and at some point it's going to hit the wall. You know, maybe a presidential election from the Republican point of view isn't the best time to have that debate, right. but at some point we need to have but it. It, it. But is this a conversation that, you know, we elect smart politicians and they should have that debate in Congress? <laughs> we do? Yeah, I mean, well, uh, <laughs> presumably we do. You know, is, is this, a, is this a, a, you know, a lawmaker's debate, not necessarily a populist debate? 
or is this you think that you know the government? I mean, the, the well, people I mean, I do, I do think there. ultimately, you know, we're a democracy, and the people need to decide, you know, where where we want to where we're headed. I mean, we have an entitlement pr problem that is real, whether you're liberal, whether you're a conservative, whether you're Democrat or Republican. Um, I, I am not against talking about this in a presidential election, although the truth of the matter is, you know. The party that proposes change almost always gets their head handed to right. them, and I suspect that may be where we're headed. So, Joe, how does this play for Mitt Romney in November? I think pretty poorly in the end. All right, so you, your bottom line, we should have this debate. This is a big debate, mm -hmm. but it's not going to work out well for Mitt Romney. That, that's basically where I am. Great. That's it for us. We'll see you back here next week, same time. Mm -hmm.